overnight. Tax force crushes over 400 motorcycles seized in Lagos for breaking law, restricting them to some routes. Police say it's a warning to others. Chief of Defence Staff restates resolve of the federal government to defend the nation's territorial boundaries, says capacity of armed forces receiving a boost. Zamfara State Governor says over 500 kidnapped victims rescued following enforcement of stringent security measures by security personnel. And President Biden joins others in calling for calm following court judgment which cleared a U.S. teenager of all charges for shooting two people during a racial crisis last year. And on business news tonight, Africa Development Bank pledges $25 billion to support efforts in mitigating the impact of climate change by 2025. On sports news tonight, Smooth FC, led by Brazil legend Roberto Carlos, emerges winner of the much-anticipated Budweiser Game of Kings exhibition match played in Lagos. Motorcyclists who have the habit of defying the law that prohibits them from flying some routes in Lagos, it may be the time for them to rethink. This is because over 400 motorcycles seized from the 14 riders across Lagos State have been crushed by the police tax force. The Lagos State Commissioner of Police, Hakim Odumusu, who witnessed the crushing, explained that the act will serve as a warning to others. He adds that the seizure of the motorcycles is a penalty for breaking the law. Hundreds of motorcycles, popularly known as Okada, seized from different parts of Lagos State for various offenses. They have been condemned by a Lagos court and are here assembled at a government park and being dismantled before crushing. The Lagos State Police boss is here. He explains the process is punitive, contrary to claims that the motorcycles were released after the court verdict. The motorcycle you are seen here now has been part of the instrument they use in committing crime. When somebody is kidnapped, they vary with Okada. When somebody's bag is snatched at the bus stop now, they do that. With the traffic now, we've seen all these things that Okadas are being used now to commit crime. And because of this now, now, the state government now in its wisdom decided that Okada has been restricted in some areas of the state. Now, the Dirty Thomas is when we started, we have been doing it now. We crush the Okadas once they are impounded. We crush them. So, but some people now just want to castigate police for this known to them. So they're insinuating that we sell the Okada back to those that we collect them from thereby recycling it, and that's where Okada still continue to be. And that's why we now decided that, let the Dutch Thomas know that we don't sell Okada. Neither the task of Lagos State Police Command sells the Okada. The law is there that they should be crushed once they are impounded, where they are restricted. And that's why we decided to demonstrate this. He takes us through the crushing exercise, which he says is the first stage in the line of processing. Most of them were <clears throat> impounded Why in transit, Why in operation, Why work, Why on the road. Definitely, they are multi foil inside. So we are removing that one now to avoid fire incidents. After this Monday now, you go to this second stage now. And from there now, the crushing machine is there. So they will pick them there, they will crush them. The one they crush there, nobody will use them for another thing. And this first stage of crushing. The second stage now is to get everything pieces. Within the next three days, this motorized crushing plant would have completely compressed these motorcycles ready to be turned into materials for other products. 
Meanwhile, following the prevailing security challenges in parts of Niger state, the governor, Abubakar Belo, has banned the sale of motorcycles across the state. This is contained in a statement by the secretary to the state government, Mr. Ahmed Matani, who explained that the additional measure is aimed at reducing the activities of bandits and kidnappers. It adds that the government is aware of the inconveniences the measure would cause the people, but the decision was taken in the overall interest of the state. Mr. Matani appealed to residents to cooperate with security agencies on measures being put in place for the benefit of all. He disclosed that government has also ordered security agencies to ensure effective, strict compliance and enforcement of this directive. The state government had earlier restricted the movement of all motorcycles from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. daily, stressing that the restriction order is still in force. In Zamfara State, Governor Belo Matawale says over 500 abductees have been rescued following new measures adopted to check insecurity in the state. According to him, the new security measures are yielding results, which has informed his decision to reopen some markets. The governor stated this while swearing in some newly appointed government officials. The RSM escalation in act of banditry and related criminalities has compelled us to take some drastic measures to contain the situation. The measures are aimed at depriving the bandit and their collaborators of the primary means by which they communicate and coordinate their attacks. The task force which the government constituted is working around the clock with other relevant stakeholders to ensure that the measures put in place are strictly adhered to as much as possible. Some of the successes that have been recorded as a result of the new measures contained in Executive Order 001 of 2021 are as follows. One, the government has so far been able to rescue a total of 544 of the thieves from the bandits. This includes two students from Federal Government Girls College Yawuri in Kebi State, 18 students from College of Agriculture and Animal Science in Bakura here in Zambara State, and 75 students from Government Day Secondary School Kaya in Maradu local government. A series of arrests of suspected bandits and their collaborators were made across the 14 local government councils. Interceptions of a large catch of alcoholic drinks and hard drugs meant to be taken to the bandits. We were able to close down all the hideout of informers and other bandit collaborators in Guso and other parts of the state. Against the backdrop of the recent incursion into the nation's territory by suspected Abazonian fighters from Cameroon, the Chief of Defence Staff, General Loki Irabo, says the federal government will redouble its efforts in securing the country's territorial boundaries. According to the Defence Chief, Nigeria is currently facing a lot of security threats and there is need to empower the armed forces more to carry out their professional duties. He made the comments during the graduation ceremony of senior officers drawn from the Navy, Army and Air Force at the Eastern Naval Command headquarters in Calabar, the Cross River State Capital. The Chief of Defence Staff. Cross River State Government officials and other dignitaries gather here for the graduation ceremony of Naval Course 5 officers in Calabar, the Cross River State Capital. A total of 22 graduates comprising 18 Naval officers two Air Force officers and two Army officers have been trained and are ready to contribute to tackling insecurity in the country. The Chief of Defense Staff, General Lucky Rabo, who is representing the Minister of Defense, re echoes the federal government's commitment in ensuring the banditry and insurgency are tackled decisively by the military. 
The Armed Forces of Nigeria is engaged in various operations across the country to curtail these challenges, especially the insecurity and insurgency in the Northeast, banditry, kidnappings, and other criminal activities in other parts of the country. At this juncture, let me assure you of the firm resolve of Mr. President, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of Nigeria, His Excellency President Mohamed Buhari, GCFR, to continuously support the Armed Forces to meet the task of ensuring Nigeria's security and territorial integrity. I wish to reaffirm the commitment of the Federal Government of Nigeria and indeed the Ministry of Defense at ensuring that the Armed Forces develops a requisite capacity to tackle the security challenges bedeviling our country. For the commander of the Neville War College, Nigeria, Rear Admiral Motala Bashir, the graduates are ready to be deployed into the field to contribute their quarter the towards security the provision. They came and passed through the factory, and today they are processed as finished products, ready to be deployed to the field to contribute their quota to the various operations we are conducting. I want to state that they have been adequately prepared to undertake higher level operational tasks and missions. No doubt they will make a difference, and no doubt they will add value to the various operations we are conducting. The Cross River State Government says the agency can count on them for lasting collaborations on security. Be rest assured that the state, under my able leadership, will continue to do its best to sustain the current support to the Navy and other security agencies in the state. The expertise and training gained by these officers will no doubt help them in their new assignment, particularly now that the nation is facing serious security challenges. Doing things differently will certainly bring about the desired success. For Nigeria to experience accelerated growth, there must be a new strategic direction and policy orientation towards boosting productivity and focusing on value addition. This is according to the Vice President, Professor Yemiel Shimbajo, at the graduation of participants of Senior Executive Course 43 of the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies in Jos Plateau State. He says agriculture, manufacturing, solid minerals, digital services, hospitality, as well as the entertainment industries should reflect this new direction. However, we know that if we are to inaugurate a new age of accelerated growth, then we must adopt a strategic direction and policy orientation. Today, two quarters consecutively, we've recorded growth of 5% and 4.3%. And there is no question at all that the growth trajectory will continue to be good. This is precisely what the federal government uh, seeks to do, especially through our new National Development Plan 2021 to 2025, which was recently approved by the Federal Executive Council. So in terms of strategic direction, the cornerstone of the, tragedy, of the, of the strategy is boosting productivity by focusing on value addition as a guiding principle for all sectors, especially agriculture, manufacturing, solid minerals, digital services, tourism, hospitality, entertainment, etc. In agriculture, for example, just as we seek to increase production of rice, as one example, we are paying equal attention to other parts of the value chain, such as storage, transportation, processing, and marketing, because everyone recognizes today that it is value-added services that creates jobs and opportunities, not just the, uh, not just the produ uh, production of crops. In part two, after the break, Speaker of the House of Representatives challenges the youth to get active in politics, says direct primary option in selecting candidates favors them. That's in a moment. Stay with us. You just joined us. You're watching the news at 10 live on channels television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Tax force crushes over 400 motorcycles seized in Lagos for breaking law restricting them to some routes. Police says it's a deterrent to others. Chief of Defense Staff restates resolve of the federal government to defend the nation's territorial boundaries, says capacity of armed forces receiving a boost.
Zamfara State Governor says over 500 kidnapped victims rescued following enforcement of stringent security measures by security personnel. And President Joe Biden joins others in calling for calm following court judgment which cleared a U.S. teenager of all charges for shooting two people during a racial crisis last year. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Mila, has continued to defend his support for direct primaries in choosing party candidates, stating that it favors young people. He says the Not Too Young to Run Act does not entirely make it easy for them to run for office, considering certain stumbling blocks associated with Nigerian politics. The Speaker was addressing an audience in Abuja where he challenged the youth to get actively involved in politics. The definition of democracy in the dictionary is government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And when you say that, that you realize that the word people is mentioned three times in one single sentence. What it means is that democracy starts from the primary level. And if people don't participate, they cannot be a part of the government. The National Assembly passed a not too young to run bill, which like I keep saying is a bill on paper, a paper tiger which does not give room or create the enabling environment for those who we celebrate. A young man with bold ideas, with ideas that look into the future, can actually come out and say, listen, I want to run for the state, of uh, state assembly. I want to be the governor of this state. These are my ideas. Give me the opportunity. That opportunity is created by direct primaries, not by indirect primaries. And that is why we are, we stand with those, with the people of Nigeria, that every member of the party, for the purposes of accountability, should be able to vote and decide who elects them. The River State Governor, Yesung Wike, has been talking about the readiness of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, to deliver a people-oriented governance. Governor Wike said this after inspecting infrastructural projects alongside his Adamawa state counterpart, Mr. Omaru Fintiri, in Yola, the state capital. He commended Governor Fintiri for projects, saying the PDP will replicate his feat. I'm quite impressed knowing the media resources that he gets and look at the prudence he has put into this place to manage it. This is one thing you can find in PDP government. This is one thing you can say in any state that PDP is in charge. And that is the same thing that the grace of God, the government at the center of PDP will replicate to Nigerians. We are sure that we have the persons, we have the, 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 the materials that can make Nigeria smart again. As various social and political groups canvass for better governance in the country, renowned economist Professor Pat Utomi has been speaking on efforts to give Nigerians a platform where issues of common interest can be discussed. Professor Otomi told Channel Television about a newly launched social media platform which is designed to give people a structure to challenge or influence the government. He says the platform was put together by the Coalition of Social Movement in Nigeria. The objective is to show practical ways that Nigeria can be rescued. Our country is on the brink. Uh, it's failing. Let's be honest to ourselves. We've just seen from the report of the NSAS thing that uh, people don't believe in the leadership anymore because they think the leadership does not act in their interests. They think the country is dominated by state capture. And this is partly because there is no accountability. Because there is no accountability, oftentimes what people say to you is who elected them. That means they don't represent us. We think that the future of this country depends on restoring democracy. And the way to restore accountable democracy is to show a direct link between the wishes of the people and the will of government. 
And so uh, we are unveiling a number of initiatives. The first two are essentially technology-driven initiatives to make people accountable. We want to take that in, to a next level. That next level says that we will take INEC registers, delineate constituents, and ask those constituents to evaluate the performance of all elected people, whether they are State House of Assembly people, National Assembly people, governors, or the president himself. What do you think of the performance of these people on several criteria? Security, uh, poverty fighting, job creation, and so on and so forth. If overwhelmingly the people are negative on a public office holder, we will ask them to initiate a recall of that public office holder. We're going to spend the whole of next year recalling people. The chairman of Igbo Leaders of Thought, Professor Ben Wabweze, has applauded the president's decision to consider the release of IPOP leader, Mr. Nandi Kanu. In a press release today, the constitutional lawyer says the Igbo nation appreciates the gesture, not minding the provision by the president, that granting the request will have great consequences. The elder statesman is a well-respected Igbo leader and one of the foremost constitutional lawyers that the country has produced today. To other stories now, eight companies have so far participated in the federal government's road infrastructure development and refurbishment investment tax credit scheme since it was signed by the president on January the 25th, 2019. The idea of the various tax credit schemes is to increase private sector investment in road construction and rehabilitation. Companies that are willing and able to spend their funds on the construction, provision and maintenance of various key roads across the country recover their full construction costs as tax credits over a period. In this special report, our State House correspondent, Gloria Omezoke, looks at matters arising from the implementation of the scheme. When the president signed a 10-page Executive Order 7, known as the Road Infrastructure Development and Refurbishment Investment Tax Credit Scheme, described as a public-private partnership intervention, it was seen by many as a triumph. The scheme grants income tax credits to companies or corporations that provide funding for the rehabilitation of roads and such roads are projected to guarantee speedy construction by the private sector across the country. If you look at the roads that the government has prioritized under this scheme, they tend to be very, very strategic roads. East-West roads, uh, Vajana roads, Apapa roads, and things like that. These are very significant roads where the impact can be felt across the entire value chain. It's a very good initiative, but then you have to hope and pray that uh, Politicians don't hijack it for their own vested interests uh, along the line. The federal government is confident that this initiative, which already has both prospective and actual players, is a win-win situation for the government and the private sector. The instructive thing about this is that the, this initiative helps government to achieve many things, including ministerial mandates three and four. Experts who seem to agree that the tax credit scheme is generally a feasible idea note other areas which potentially could become major concerns. For the recent one around the NMPC, um, you know, fixing road, there was a lot of debate about why do we have more roads in the north than in the south. And they said, well, but it's more expensive to build road in the south than it is in the north. And I said, at the end of the day, the conversation should have been these amounts of money if it were to go to the Federation account, we know the formula for sharing it. Just calculate it and say this is the amount that should have gone to the south. Then spend this amount on roads in the south. That's the only way you can be fair. So I think that's one big area of, uh, you know, I'll say it's a gray area. The eligible roads are to be approved by the president on the recommendation of the Minister of Finance and published in the official gazette of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So far, eight companies have been awarded road construction contracts under the scheme. The executive order also ensures that companies will be entitled to tax credits for the project cost incurred. The government can consider, at the right time, expanding the scope of projects that can be undertaken under schemes of this nature 
beyond rule. Because private sector is likely to do it quickly, complete it, quality is better, what you then find is um, you get the multiplier e effects on the economy. Imagine if Lagos Ibadan Express Road had been completed two years after we started. Some experts also believe that it might be imperative for the scheme to constantly go under review to ensure the attractiveness of the scheme is not diminished and to equally address the grey provisions of the order or any other stakeholder concerns arising from the implementation of the scheme. Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. When the news at 10 returns, we revisit the challenge of out-of-school children, this time in the north. Plus, African Development Bank to spend $25 billion in support of efforts in reducing climate change impact. That's on Business News. Join us again. Welcome back. Nigeria has continued to grapple with the challenge of out-of-school children with the northern part of the country having the highest numbers compounded by insecurity. Even though the statistics of out-of-school children is often disrupted by the states, according to data from UNICEF, National Bureau of Statistics, Universal Basic Education Commission, and the Factbox Company, there are over 10 million children between the age of 6 and 14 who are out of school. This next report examines the situation in the north and why the challenge still persists despite efforts by stakeholders. Every day during school hours, these children of school age are seen by the roadsides vending face masks. Most of them are out of school and use this as a means to support their families. We should not, in the 21st century, the year 2021, have children roaming around the streets with no education. The North has the bulk of the number of children who are out of school in the country. And this is evident in data sourced from UNICEF, NBS and UBEC, stating that 50% of the over 10 million out of school children in Nigeria are concentrated in seven states. Sokoto, Zamfara, Katsina, Kanu, Jigawa, Bochi, and Boruno. In Dungulbel village of Bochi, the only primary school available is in serious decay, and so the desire to pursue formal education is gradually declining. Our children often complain about the terrible condition of learning in their school. This has made it difficult to instill love for education among children. Infrastructure decay has been listed as one of the factors that limits access to basic education, in addition to economic, political and social cultural barriers. According to the federal government, its efforts with the collaboration of states and the World Bank have seen enrollment of about one million children in schools through the Better Education Service Delivery for All Operational Projects, implemented in 17 states. These are new enrollees of the program in Niger State, which used to have over 500,000 out-of-school children. With over 800,000 children out of school, learning institutions have remained closed since September due to activities of bandits. And to Borno in the northeast, efforts of the states and willing partners are sometimes stalled by the insurgency. It is not that the figures is not uh, going down, but don't forget that the crisis in Bono and Yubi is still even in, is escalating to some extent. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one. For instance, we had we're supporting Dikwa and Mongunu, and in Dikwa, we had to close down in March after the attack of 21 centers, non formal learning centers, and some other partners there too. I uh, have to close them because of the attack. So such kids down, they've been. Uh, displaced and they can have their education again. In Kano, the traditional institution is at the forefront of the enrollment campaign. I want to appeal to all parents and caregivers 
ensure that the children enroll early in school and continue to attend, to attend school until they complete at least basic education at the age of 16 years. Even though basic education is a fundamental human right that is officially free and compulsory, the number of children not in school in the country keeps rising and experts continue to recommend a multi-pronged approach in tackling the problem. Still talking education, the National Association of Polytechnic Students is advocating the appointment of PhD holders or professors as rectors of polytechnics in the country. Addressing a news conference in the nation's capital, Abuja, the president of the association, Mr. Sunday Asuku, lauded the new Polytechnic Act, which provides for the appointment of the most qualified as substantive rectors. According to him, the era of appointing rectors who are not educationally qualified will no longer be tolerated. The significance of the Polytechnic being one among the first generation and premier polytechnics in Nigeria, which serve as reference to back the ongoing agitation for an end to the dichotomy between first degree and HND in Nigeria, arose our interest. We have bid farewell to the era of appointing mere MSc holders as rector of any polytechnic. With advent of the new Polytechnic Act signed by President Mohamed Gwadi, we stand by the letters and words of new Act in appointment of rector for our polytechnic nationwide. It is our wish that professors head our polytechnics going forward in the absence of one, at least a PhD order with proven in-depth of academic research experience, management and innovations be the next in line. Now shall reject any move to impose less qualified individuals as rector of any polytechnic. Afer Babalola University in Adoikiti, Kiti State, has churned its fourth set of medical doctors from the college. During their induction ceremony in the institution, the founder of the university, Afer Babalola, challenged the doctors to contribute positively to the field of medicine. He also asked them to ensure that everything learned during their training are put into use for the good of society. The graduates radiating with joy and feeling fulfilled, having accomplished their lifetime aspiration to become medical doctors. 85 of them are presented for their induction, and the founder of the university takes up this responsibility. An engaging induction lecture as the resource person underlines the place of trust and surpassing the status quo. If that element of trust is lost or absent, then I'm afraid. You may cure your patient of his disease, but you will not heal your patient of his condition. It is therefore not about money. It's about the dignity with which you practice the very noble profession you have chosen to practice for life. It's a lifetime profession because a doctor never retires. The founder of Afe Babalala University at Duikiti is proud of this feat and it reminds the new doctors to remember all lessons and values offered them while in the tertiary institution. Today, you are going home very soon with a certificate issued by this university. You are rooted in quality and functional, functional education. More importantly, you have been trained to respect, you have been trained to be cultural, you have been trained to be dedicated, and you have been trained to keep on leading. In a country where medical tourism is a major factor, these new medical personnel will certainly do well by impacting positively on the medical sector, such that patients and other Nigerians will gain more confidence and take advantage of what medical practitioners can offer them in the country. Outside our shores, Nigerian businesses over the week showcased their goods and services at the second edition of the Intra-African Trade Fair holding in Durban, South Africa. 
The IATF 2021 is hosted by the African Export Import Bank and the South African government. The trade fair has attracted about 50,000 visitors and is expected to generate $40 billion in trade deals. Our correspondent, Teniola Shobowali, has this report. With a contingent of about 1,500, Nigeria's presence at the Intra-African Trade Fair in Durban, South Africa, is impressive. From clothes, footwear, bags and other products, traders were able to showcase their services, sign deals and interact with other exhibitors from across the continent over the week. It's a good exposure for me. We've signed some deals and uh, it's given us more visibility than we had earlier. It's been a platform for us to also showcase uh, uh, what we're doing and the jobs, the impact we're making. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, most importantly, been a source of inspiration. You know, like when you look around and see what's going on in other uh, parts of Africa, uh, you realize that, um, yes, we cooperate, but then we need to learn from each other. Nigeria's participation at the fair was spearheaded by the Nigeria Export Promotion Council for a second time with the aim of promoting economic activities between Nigeria and the rest of the continent. The CEO of the NEPC, Shegma Wolowo, hopes that come 2023, officials will have resolved several issues constraining trade. We are not trading with ourselves. I always say confidently that everything Africa needs is in Africa. Why can't goods move seamlessly, you know, from Nigeria to Ghana? Why can't goods move seamlessly to interland Burkina Faso? Those are all the things we need to resolve. Why don't we have airlines? Why don't we have shipping lines that transform, that can help transform this economy? And that is key. That is really key for the leaders to work on. And then we can trade. On the sidelines, Nigerian companies also signed deals worth over $1.5 billion with the African Export Import Bank. About 55 countries have taken part in the Intra-African Trade Fair, hosted by the African Export Import Bank and the South African government. Well, Africa is blessed with many resources as exhibited here at the Intra-African Trade Fair. The hope is that this fair will provide the opportunity for these businesses to interact and essentially boost trade to other African countries. From Durban, South Africa, Teniola Shibowale for Channel's Television News. For more business stories, here is Ladi Williams. Thanks, Melinda. On business news, the president of the Africa Development Bank, Dr. Kimomi Adeshino, has been speaking on the potential of the marine industry towards job creation and economic development for the African people. Dr. Kimomi was speaking virtually during the second uh, Growing Blue Conference, explains that in spite of the huge potential uh, inherent in the marine industry across Africa, the sector has been ex experiencing low productivity owing to weak policies, environmental pollutions, as well as climate change. Do take a listen. Africa is especially well endowed to tap into the blue economy. The continent has maritime zones that stretch 13 million square kilometers, encompassing territorial seas, continental shelves, that also stretch up to 6.5 million kilometers. And of course, 38 African countries are coastal. Yet, these resources remain largely unexploited. And where they are exploited, they are done in ways that are not sustainable. And the sustainability of our planet and our oceans is threatened today in ways that could become irreversible without strategic interventions. Today, the world and Africa's blue economy faces code red. We must do all we can on climate change to turn code red to code blue for a more vibrant and sustainable blue economy. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the African Development Bank Group is leading on climate financing 
for Africa. We have committed to doubling our climate finance to $25 billion by 2025. And the Pension Commission of Nigeria has issued a statement clarifying the actual beneficiary of Leadway Pensions shares in FBN Holdings. According to the statement by Pencom, ownership of pension funds belong to pensioners and not a third party as FBN Holdings recently claimed. The Commission's attention had been drawn to several publications in the media alleging breach of its regulation on investment of pension fund assets by Leadway Pension Limited. And uh, bearish sentiments uh, dominated the local equities uh, this week as the market recorded losses in four out of five trading sessions following profit-taking activities. Consequently, the All Share Index declined by 0.12% week on week to settle at 43,199 points. Notably, profit taken in total, GTCO, FBN Holdings and Nigerian Breweries uh, drove the weekly loss. Activity levels were mixed as trading volumes declined by 4.8% week on week, while value grew by 33.4%. Sectoral performance was broadly bearish as all sectors closed in the red. The oil and gas was down 3.63%, was the biggest loser, followed by banking, consumer goods, insurance, and industrial goods indexes. Vitaform topped the Guinness chart for this week. Its uh, share price rose by 17.11%, while Qtix by 42.68% led the underperforming stocks. The trio of FBN Holdings, GT Co, Sterling Bank contributed 45.85% and 30.63% to the total volume and value of shares traded in the week. And that's our business news. It's back to you, Melinda. Many thanks, Ladi. And for the latest in the world of sports, here's Chris Ellens. Welcome to Sports News. Uh, it was found an excitement in Lagos as beverage brand Budweiser staged an exhibition game tagged Game of Kings. The premium brand organized the event in expression of appreciation to its customers. This report takes, us, takes a look at the event. The much-anticipated Budweiser Game of Kings takes center stage at the Mobolaji Johnson Stadium in Lagos. Budweiser, sponsors of the English Premier League and Spanish La Liga, feature John Terry and Roberto Carlos in an exhibition game also involving home-based professionals. Excited football fans, journalists and dignitaries are in attendance to see the football legends. Smooth FC, led by Roberto Carlos, defeated Kings FC, led by John Terry, on penalties to emerge winners. International breweries, makers of Budweiser in Nigeria, seek to give millions of football lovers, who double as lovers of the Budweiser brand, a unique experience that will stay with them for a long time. Um, Budweiser has always had a passion for football, and we know that um, football is something that Nigerians are passionate about. Um, what, what we wanted to achieve here today was to give a chance to consumers to be part of the whole football experience. Well, we operate in Nigeria. Uh, I know Budweiser is a global brand. We operate in so many countries across the world. We are the biggest beer brand in the world. Um, but at the same time, in every market that we operate, we try to give the best of ourselves to that market, irrespective of the fact that we're a big global brand. So we're choosing Nigeria because we operate in Nigeria. We launched Budweiser in Nigeria in 2018 with the World Cup. We've had massive acceptance, massive um, success, and we are so happy to give back to our consumers with this platform. Budweiser receives praise for putting together the event. As you all know, it's not easy being a manager. <laughs> though this is my first team being, uh, being the manager, though. And um, 
I thank God for that, and I thank God for giving me this opportunity. I think it's a wonderful one for me and also my colleagues. You can see the joy. You don't even got to know who won the cup because everybody is happy playing alongside with John Terry and Roberto Carlos. Organizers insist that they are willing to continue providing the best of entertainment to football fans in appreciation of their patronage. In the Premier League, Chelsea tightened its grip on the top sports, punishing the feelings of lackluster lack Leicester City with a 3-0 victory at the King Park Stadium. Oli Watkins and Tyron Meigs scored in the final six minutes as Steven Gerrard enjoyed a memorable first match as Aston Villa manager with a 2-0 victory over Brighton. In other matches, Burnley played a 3-3 draw with Crystal Palace, while Norwich defeated, defeated Southampton 2-1. Elsewhere, Manchester United suffered an embarrassing 4-1 defeat at Vic Raid Road against Watford. Wolves squeezed past West Ham with a 1-0 win at uh, Molyneux Stadium. In the last game of the day, Liverpool hammered Arsenal 4-0 at Anfield. That'll be all on sports. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chris Alems and back to you, Malina. Many thanks, Chris. Calls for calm have increased after U.S. teenager Kyle Rittenhouse, who shot dead two people during the racial crisis last year, was cleared of all charges. Mr. Rittenhouse said he was acting in self-defense when he shot the men and injured a third person in Wisconsin. The verdict was given on Friday after a high-profile trial that divided the United States and sparked protests in some cities. Hundreds of protesters from New York on Friday held rallies to demonstrate against the verdict of the jury that acquitted 18-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse of murder and the fatal shooting of two men during racial protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin last year. Even in Portland, angry protesters cornered police into a garage. Around 150 protesters started small fires but quickly dispersed. In a decision that reignited fierce debate about gunfights and the boundaries of self-defense in the United States, jurors found Rittenhouse not guilty of all charges. Two counts of homicide, one count of attempted homicide for wounding a third man, and two counts of recklessly endangering safety in protests marred by arson, rioting, and looting. We're very happy with the verdict. To say that we were relieved would be a gross misunderstatement. And Kyle is not here. He's on his way home. He wants to get on with his life. President Joe Biden said on Friday he supported the jury's decision and urged Americans to react with calm. The president had tweeted a video during last year's election campaign that appeared to link Rittenhouse to white supremacists. Well, look, I stand by what the jury has concluded. The jury system works, and we have to abide by it. Back in Kenosha, a prayer vigil was observed on Friday, a few blocks away from the courthouse, just hours after the jury acquitted Rittenhouse. Reverend Dr. Monica Cummings, an assistant minister for pastoral care at the Bradford Community Church, was leading the prayers. She said the community was feeling a wide range of emotions. Profoundly disappointed, sad, angry, crying, grieving, and also looking to the future like, okay, we've got work to do. The girlfriend of Anthony Hubber, one of the two men shot dead by Rittenhouse, said she was heartbroken by his acquittal. Nobody here is ever going to stop. Come on. Nobody here is ever going to stop attempting to expose the flaws in this system. The teenager and the men shot are all white. The incident happened during the violent protests over the shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake, by a white police officer. And the main news again. Police task force in Lagos today crushed over 400 motorcycles seized for breaking the law, restricting them to designated routes. Commissioner of Police Hakim Odumotu says action will serve as a deterrent to others. That's the news at 10 tonight. On behalf of the team, good night.